everyone and welcome back to another episode of Diam Canada and our first one of 2022. I hope you guys had a wonderful new year. If you are new to my channel, welcome. And in case you didn't know, we cover the lesser known murder mystery and mayhem cases that go on here in Canada and Canada only. This case I'm going to be talking about today is a very important case in the Canadian justice system. And just like every other video, all of the information that I will be sharing with you guys today was gathered all from public sources. And I have listed all of the sources I have even looked at down in the description um, box down below. I obviously have done my best to get the most true facts and statements out to you guys. But if I have messed up on anything, please let me know in the comments down below, but also leave your sources so we do know where the correction is coming from. So today's case is gonna be a long one. It has many twists and turns. And so I do have all of my notes off to the side of the camera, just so you guys know if you do see me looking off a lot throughout this video, um, that will be why. So let's get to today's case. It was a beautiful spring night, Friday, May 28th, 1971, in the little town of Sydney, which is located on Cape Breton Island in Nova Scotia. There was a dance at a local church that night near Wentworth Park, with, with, near Wentworth Park where a lot of the teens were hanging out. And one of those teens that was attending the dance was Sanford William Seal, who went by Sandy. Sandy was 17 years old and a grade nine student at McLennan Junior High. He came from a very well-respected and outstanding family where he was one of five children. Um, he had three brothers, John, Howard, and Raymond, and he had one sister named Elizabeth. Sandy loved to play hockey and it was said that he was a star player. He played with the St. Teresa Midgets team and he also played on the Murray McIntosh's Kinsman Midgets who had just played a game in Hamilton, Ontario, which is a pretty decent travel from Cape Breton Island. Sandy was very popular and liked in the town of Sydney and he had tons of potential, especially in hockey. The dance started to slow down that Sandy was attending and so he decided to leave the dance and when he left, he decided to head through Wentworth Park. Wentworth Park is an urban park, uh, which basically means it's in the middle of a city. So there's buildings and houses all around this park. And this park in particular was a very popular hangout in the town of Sydney. And for people of all ages, on a Friday night in particular, you would often find a lot of people hanging out in the Wentworth Park. As Sandy made his way through the park, he ran into his friend, 17 year old Donald Marshall Jr. who went by Jr. Jr. was actually on his way to the dance himself when he ran into Sandy. So obviously he asked Sandy how the dance was going and Sandy told him that it was pretty much dying out. Jr. and Sandy hung around talking for a little bit by the bridge in Wentworth Park until two men approached them and asked for a cigarette. The two men were lent a cigarette and then um, as they were talking, the older men asked if they wanted to go back to his house because he had a bottle of rum there. And the boys replied no. And as the two men started to walk away and leave, the older gentleman turned around and said, I don't like blank and blanks, which Donald was an indigenous person and Sandy Seal was a black man. So you can fill in the blanks of what exactly was said there. So the older gentleman started to walk away when he said, I don't like blah, blah, blah. And then he turned around while taking a knife out of his coat pocket and he stabbed Sandy Seal in the left side of his stomach, causing Sandy to collapse instantly. He then reached around to stab Junior, but Junior was able to throw his arm in front and block the stabbing, resulting in a huge slash across his arm. Junior turned and ran from the situation while the two men also fled, leaving Sandy there to bleed out onto the sidewalk. The first person Junior ran into was a young boy named Maynard Chant, who was 14 years old at the time. Look at what they did to me, Junior said to Maynard as he showed his four and a half inch gash across his forearm. Who, Maynard replied. Two fellows over in the park. My buddy is over there with a knife in his stomach. The two of them then told two separate couples walking by about what had happened in the park. And they were all able to flag down a car, which... Um, after being explained what was going on, he gave Maynard and Junior a ride back to Sandy in the park. 
And while this was all going on, there actually was another passerby who just happened to hear everything going on. And he was actually a retired RCMP police officer. And so he had actually called into the R to the Sydney police station, um, which Junior and Maynard didn't know about. But he called in and explained everything that he had just overheard and seen and let them know what was going on. By the time the vehicle with Junior and Maynard arrived back to Sandy, a small group had already started to form um, around Sandy. Junior was in a panic and he was showing his gash to the group saying um, that he was also there and that he was stabbed as well. And Sandy was said to just be lying in agony, moaning, and at one point he did say how he thought he was gonna die. Sandy was bleeding excessively and his intestines were protruding from the gash in his stomach. Mater took off his white shirt that he was wearing to try and slow the flow of blood while Junior ran to a nearby house in order to call the emergency services like the ambulance and the police. Remember this was 1971 and so cell phones weren't even invented yet. They weren't actually invented until 1973 in case you were interested. Now unfortunately on that particular night the first responders were actually already very busy with a huge car accident that had happened pretty much around the exact same time as Sandy being stabbed. And because of that, it took some time for the first responders to arrive on scene. Once first responders were able to arrive, they brought Sandy and Junior to the local hospital where Sandy was immediately sent into emergency operation and Junior was given 10 stitches. Sandy's parents arrived at the hospital as soon as possible but were denied being able to see him and they were forced to wait out in the waiting room without being updated on his condition or information or progress whatsoever. As Sandy was in operation, Junior was being stitched up and after he was stitched up, he gave an extremely detailed description of the two men that he had seen to the police officer that was there at the hospital. Junior's description was, the one man was heavy set, short, dark blue coat to his knees, hair was gray, black low shoes, wearing glasses with dark rims. The second man was tall, about 5'11", black hair, clean shaven, corduroy, cor corduroy coat, three quarters in length and brown. And from there, an APB was put out to the Sydney police. If you don't know what an APB is, an APB stands for All Points Bulletin, and it is an in electronic information broadcast um, so basically the dispatch would put in the APB and it would dis be, and the information would be broadcast to whichever officers they would like. Now also happening at the time of Sandy being operated on and Junior being stitched up and giving him the description of the man, the police were also going back out and going to find Maynard Champ because they had not previously brought him to the hospital or anything like that. He was just left in Wentworth Park. So the police went out to find him and Maynard Chant was found hitchhiking home and he still had blood all over him um, from giving his shirt to Sandy. Maynard was picked up and brought back to the hospital so invest investigators could really ask him everything that he knew. Maynard had expressed to the investigators that he had seen everything, um, but at that time he was never formally interviewed. Word traveled quickly about what had happened in Wentworth Park and of course, as with most telephone games go, information got turned around and the news started to spread that it was actually Junior that had been murdered in Wentworth Park. And that rumor had actually made it back to the reserve in which um, Junior's parents and family lived. And so when the police pulled up to the Marshall home, they all feared the absolute worst until they seen Junior step out of the vehicle relatively unharmed. They all breathed a sigh of relief, unaware of what was yet to come. So now is where I'm going to pause and give you guys a little bit of a background on who Donald Junior Marshall was. Since this was 1971 in Canada, Indigenous people were forced to live in small plots of land called reserves, unlike their ancestors who roamed the land freely. This was at the time of residential schools, like I said, reserves, um, all the assimilation. It just gets worse and worse, you know, you know. And at this time, uh, Sydney, Nova Scotia was known to be very, very racist. 
Junior himself said that you couldn't even walk down the street. Being native and being off the reserve felt like something illegal. You would be called terrible names, jumped, and even thrown in jail for whatever half-assed excuse that they can make up at the time. Donald Marshall Jr. was the son of Caroline Marshall and Donald Marshall Sr. And Donald Marshall Sr. was actually the Grand Chief of the Mi'kmaq Nation, which had about 5,000 people in the maritime land at that time. They lived on the Member 2 Reserve, which was actually the name of the leader of the indigenous group that had signed into Christianity way back. Different story, but fun fact. Donald Marshall Sr. was a well-respected man, even off of the reserve, and he had a drywalling business, which he wasn't really paid with money often. Um, Junior actually said that he was paid with food and clothing most of the time. At one point, uh, Junior was actually working for his dad, and they actually did the drywalling on Sandy Seal's house when it was being built. Junior was the oldest of 13 children. They had four boys, seven girls, and two children that were actually adopted. Junior was forced into a white school, um, after elementary school and of course um, he didn't feel like he fit in there at all and he felt like the white kids were treated a lot better than the Indian kids those are his words which we know now definitely was true he barely spoke English and he ended up failing a few grades when he was 15 years old he was expelled for hitting a teacher with a chair but after she had grabbed him by the ear because he was chewing gum so like, I don't really blame him. That's just my opinion. So he was actually offered the choice to either go to the Shelbourne School for Boys, which was a notoriously bad place for misbehaving Mi'kmaq boys. And then he also had the option to either go work for his um, dad as a drywalling apprentice. And so obviously Junior chose the latter. Another thing about Junior, he was known as a bit of a scrapper. He didn't stand up to being pushed around and would fight back whenever he felt need be. And with it being 1971, it was pretty often. Junior did not like to be walked over and didn't back down easily, even if it was an authority figure. But Junior was also said to be pretty shy as well. Like I had mentioned, the town of Sydney was very racist towards indigenous peoples. And of course, so were the police. And it seemed the police in Sydney did not like Junior in particular. Junior was known to the police, of course, as being a fighter, along with some other petty offenses, which like, if you really want the details, just go and look it up. It's really stupid, which I don't feel are even relevant at all because I don't feel that they were even justified to charge him with those offenses. So anyways, like I had mentioned, this was the time where being off the reserve was basically illegal and they would basically charge them with whatever the hell they could. So back at the hospital, less than 20 hours after the incident in Wentworth Park, on Saturday, May 29th, 1971, after going to emergency surgery operations and the hospital doing all they could, Sanford Sandy Seal, unfortunately, just 17 years old, passed away due to his injuries. Turning the stabbing investigation into now a homicide investigation, involving a black man, an indigenous man, two unaccounted for persons, and one very, very racist police force. Now, finding out that his friend had passed away due to his injuries, the only thing Junior really could do now was help find the murderers and the accomplice, or the murderer and accomplice. Junior went out to try and find the men every chance that he could. Since he's seen their faces and outfits, he felt like if he seen them walking down the street, he would be able to event identify them instantly. But every single time Junior went to go and look for the two men, the police would find him, pick him up, and take him back to the reserve in a squad car. Even though Junior had given the police the description of the two men at the hospital and an APB was sent out, it really didn't seem like the police were interested in that information, if at all. Hours after Sandy passed away, the police went out and found Junior's best friend, Arthur Paul, who went by Artie. They took him to the police station and interrogated him, implying that Junior had been the one to stab Sandy and Artie was covering up for him. Even though Artie was nowhere near them that night, nor was he even involved in the incident. 
The police, specifically Detective John McIntyre, knew what kind of case they wanted to build and were pretty much dead set on doing it right from the beginning and by any means necessary. They had Junior come to the police station every single day for about a week and even though Junior was eager to tell them what he knew and wanted to help as much as possible, he was ignored and he sat in the station from morning till night for almost a week and without ever being formally interviewed. As Junior sat in the station, he watched as the police interviewed many people over the course of the week and three kids in particular were interviewed much, much more frequently, he noticed. Patricia Harris was one of the kids that were brought in. She was a 14 year old girl at the time who had been in the park that night. She had expressed to the police that she had seen the two men prior to the stabbing. Now the other kid being interviewed repeatedly was of course Maynard Chant. He was 14 years old, like I had said, and he was the kid that Junior had ran up to for help. And the last kid Junior watched be brought in for interviews over and over and over was 16 year old John Pratico, who wasn't at the park that night at all. Initially, the statements that all of these three kids gave to the police pretty much lined up perfectly with what Junior was saying, of course, besides John Pratico, who wasn't even there. But this isn't really what the police wanted to hear because these stories didn't line up with the kind of case they were trying to build. So the police began to use tactics that they thought would get them be a better response. Patricia was terrified to be there and it was obvious to the police. So the police really used that to their advantage. They interrogated her at nighttime without any parents around or attorneys around. And Maynard was actually on pro parole at the time for a little petty crime of stealing milk bottle change. And he had also revealed that he had been drinking that night, which was a parole violation. And so the police really used that scare tactic on him that he was going to be sent to prison if he didn't cooperate. John Pratico, who I feel particularly bad for, was actually mentally unstable and the police unfortunately took advantage of that. After the week of interrogations, the police had the statements that they wanted. All other statements were allegedly thrown out. Patricia's statement now said that she didn't see two other men in the park. She only seen Junior that night. And Maynard and John's statements both claimed that they witnessed Junior and Sandy arguing and then Junior stabbing Sandy. Once those formal statements were taken and official, now they decided was time to take a formal statement from Junior. They brought him in, took a statement, and then they pointed to the statement that they had written for him and told him to sign your name. Now, once again, Junior didn't know English very well. He wasn't able to read what was written to them, nor did he, of course, nor did he have an interpreter of any kind or a translator. Um, there or even his parents. So from Junior's eyes, he was signing because the police told him to. Strictly that. Now during that week after the death of Sandy, while Junior and the others were being interrogated, I mean interviewed, Junior's family was living in complete fear. The rumor around town was spreading that Junior had killed Sandy and the town was in an uproar because of this, thanks to the news and the police. While the police were being praised left and right for their amazing detective work um, and the news bashed Donald Marshall Jr., Jr.'s family was getting death threats and even people on the reserve were telling the Marshall family that they needed to get out and leave the reserve since Jr. had killed somebody. Another thing that didn't help the people on the reserve was that the police had actually put up a roadblock at the reserve so that people can go in and out, which I'm sure is safe to say fueled the anger of the people living on the reserve even more. One week after Sandy had passed on June 4th, 1971, John McIntyre, um, sorry, Detective John McIntyre told, Marsh, told the marshals that they should pack up and leave the reserve since it was getting so dangerous for them to be there. And so they did what they were told by the police and they packed up their vehicle 
and they started driving to the reserve that his mother was from. And as they drove, they noticed that their vehicle following them. Once they arrived at the home, they got out of the vehicle and an RCMP officer who was in the vehicle following them got out of his vehicle and started questioning Junior on why he was running away. And of course, Junior replied that he wasn't running, that John McIntyre had told him to leave. But it was clear the RCMP knew what, knew what they were doing, and they told Junior he was under arrest for the murder of Sandy Seal. Junior started saying that he had nothing to do with it, but Donald Marshall Sr. braced his son and told him to just go easily and don't make a fuss and they'll figure it all out. So Junior listened to his father and his family watched as Junior was taken away from his family, his childhood, his freedom, and his whole life. The trial started on November 2nd of that same year, 1971, and Junior was tried as an adult. Now this trial was a pretty big thing for the little town of Sydney, um, especially having it involve two 17 year olds and then adding the racial element on top of it. Sandy, of course, was black, if I didn't had mentioned that. And the black community really rallied to make sure that justice was served for Sandy. Don't forget that the community, the community only knew what they were being told. And so they really didn't know Junior's side of the story, if at all. And they just knew what was being reported in newspapers and what the police were saying. So the community really truly thought at this time that Junior was the killer and there was no doubt about it. Except of course for Junior's family who fully believed that he was innocent. Unfortunately, the outrage around the murder and the trial and everything was volatile. And so Junior's father attended the trial but his mother found it just too difficult to even attend. Throughout the few short days of the trial, Junior stuck to his story and it never changed. The Crown had no forensic evidence to tie Junior to the case, but they did have what they thought were eyewitnesses. And so that was their main focal point. Along with that, they really focused a lot on the fact that Junior had a tattoo on his arm that said, I hate cops. And the doctor that first treated Junior in the hospital um, stated that it chilled her to the bone to see that tattoo. And while on the stand, she was also asked if the wound could have been self-inflicted. And she had stated it's possible, which I'm sure it it is possible. Now, when it came to the eyewitnesses being on the stand, this is where the trial became messy, to say the least. Patricia had gone to a lawyer immediately after signing her statement with the police, and she was actually advised by her lawyer and to tell the truth while she was on the stand. Uh, but when she got to the stand and was being pressured by the Crown and the detective John McIntyre, she changed her story back to her final statement um, to the police. Now, when it came to Maynard Chan, he stuck by the statement that the police approved um, and said that he was walking home from Sunday school on that Friday night, which was around midnight. Yes, you heard that. He was at Sunday school on a Friday night around midnight, walking home. And when it came to John Pratico's testimony, his was the most compelling. John had testified and stuck with the statement the police had told him to say, but then afterwards, outside of the courtroom, he broke down and went to Junior's dad and he was crying and he was telling him what the police had done and he was telling them how he was pressured into giving a false statement and then the police told him what to say and everything was just a big lie. And he also expressed that he wanted to come clean to the court about it all. And so once they got into court and John Pratico started saying stuff, John McIntyre immediately called for a recess. During this recess, the detective John McIntyre called. A number of people, including the judge and the police officers and the Crown and John Pratico alone, all went into a room away from the public just by themselves. Once they had emerged, John was then placed back on the stand 
and the Crown once again questioned him, and this time his statement stayed the same as before, that he had seen Junior stabbing Sandy Steele after arguing. The judge also didn't allow for Junior's defense counsel to conduct a cross-examination on John Pratico, and so the defense was unable to even question anything about everything that just went on, or even his testimony. Junior was also put on the stand and he stuck to the same story, that he was a victim too. But the Crown argued that Junior had stabbed himself, and like usual, the Crown just tore Junior apart, as they usually do in like any kind of court case. And they noted how he kept looking down the whole time and he never made eye contact and he was soft-spoken and they had to keep asking him to speak up. And once again, on top of all that, he didn't know English well, even when it was spoken words. So after only three days of testimonies, the all-white male jury was sent out, sent out for deliberation and after just four hours, they came back with their decision. Donald Marshall Jr. was found guilty of non-capital murder or second degree murder and sentenced to life in prison at Dorchester Maximum Penitentiary. Unfortunately, the guilty verdict didn't just stop at Jr. His family also suffered greatly, not only due to the fact that their family member was going away for life, but because the people in Sydney basically treated them all as convicted murderers themselves. They were treated as outcasts and other children were no longer allowed to play with them. And on top of that, Donald Marshall Sr.'s drywalling business went under. He was still a grand chief of the Mi'kmaq people, but that role isn't a paying one. And he actually had to pay out of pocket in order just to get things done for his people. So while Junior was waiting to be processed and all that fun stuff that came after being found guilty, he was held at the county jail with Detective John McIntyre's partner as his guard. And with his partner being the guard, they did everything that was possible to make Junior's life a living hell. So Junior was there for 14 months and he had to endure things like being put in dark rooms for days and he even stated that he was put into a birdcage for an entire week. He tried to appeal the court's decision, of course, but he would be left in the dark not knowing anything that was even going on with his appeals. At one point, he had reached out to his lawyer to find out what was going on, and his lawyer actually informed him that his appeal had been denied like three months ago. Um, he was just never informed, you know, it's fine. It was three months, it was denied. Well, you don't need to know, it was denied. But pff, nothing's changing, bro. Pff. Now, while Junior was sitting up at the county jail, things were actually going on in the town. Now, bear with me on this next part because I will be quoting what was spoken and not to diminish what was said, I will be keeping things as I found them in the sources. So. 10 days after Junior was convicted, James William McNeil, who also went by Jimmy, went into the Sydney police station. And he had a quite the interesting story to tell them. Jimmy went to the police and told them, and now I quote, that Indian didn't do it. I was there. It was Roy Epsery who stabbed that kid. Jimmy went on to tell them how him and Roy, who was a 59 year old ship cook, were hanging out and drinking that night of May 28th um, at the State Tavern in Sydney. And as they left the tavern, they decided to drunkenly cut through Wentworth Park. Jimmy claimed he heard Roy say, I got something for you. As he placed his hand into his right pocket and pulled out a knife, then drove it into the colored fellow's side, as Jimmy put it. The investigators asked Jimmy what side, and Jimmy answered, the left side of the colored fellow, I seen Roy's hand and knife full of blood. The investigator replied, did you see the Indian get stabbed? And Jimmy said, no, I did not. The investigator then asked what happened after? And Jimmy said, Roy went home and I went with him and he washed the knife under the tap and his hands off. 
Then he told me to not say anything about it. The investigator then asked, did you ask him why he had done it? And Jimmy said, yes. He said self-defense. After the police received this information, they did not tell Junior or his lawyers of the new developments. They kept it extremely hush. Instead, they did the bare minimum. An RCMP officer came and interviewed Roy Epsery, who stated he knew nothing, of course. They did also half-ass interview Roy's family, which was his wife and his son, but they said they didn't see anything at all. And the cops actually did not interview Roy's daughter, who was 13 years old at the time, because they just basically assumed that she just didn't see anything, didn't know anything. They then gave Roy a polygraph test. And if you are um, a regular true crime consumer, then you'll know all about polygraphs and all of that. And so I, for one, in my personal opinion, I am really highly against them. I feel there's way too many things to be able to give a false reading and deceive the test. And so that's just, just as my opinion. So blah, blah, blah. They gave Roy Epsery a polygraph test and they concluded that he was being truthful. And we don't know what questions were asked or anything about this polygraph test that was apparently conducted. Now, once Roy was slightly looked into, um, the RCMP re-interviewed McNeil, but wasn't really. They basically just told him that he was, quote, a feeble-minded alcoholic who imagined the whole thing, which is sad. Poor Jimmy. On December 21st, just before Christmas, the RCMP officer filed a report stating he had conducted a thorough review of the case and concluded that Donald Marshall Jr. had stabbed Sandy Seal. Merry Christmas, Donald. The unprofessionalism is astounding. Now, I want to make the comment that although it was went wrong about the wrong way, the police did feel as though they had their guy and that he was convicted and everything was done with. And they were also getting such high praises for all of their most amazing police work. So of course, in a corrupt and racist system, they aren't going to press the issue. Even if they shut, that would undo all of their hard work. Not to mention that it would come to light that they locked up a possibly innocent man. Plus, it was almost Christmas. And who the heck wants to do paperwork through Christmas in hopes of just finding out the truth? So now let's stop on the question, who the hell is Roy Epsery? Well, like I said, he was a 59-year-old ship cook. And Roy had quite the rep for being a cranky and rude old man. And he was actually also particularly unpredictable and especially violent while drunk. And he was drunk and drinking often. Roy also matched the description Junior had given to the police officers the night of the incident pretty much to a T. And on top of all that, Roy actually had a criminal record for a weapons charge involving a knife previously. Now, like I stated, Junior was never informed of the new developments in his case. And after 14 months in the county jail on an inspection day, Junior was asked how long he was doing. And Junior replied with life. And the inspector said, what the fuck are you doing here? Sorry, my French. And the very next day, Junior was transferred out of the county jail facility into Dorchester, a maximum security facility. Junior said that his time in Dorchester was the worst. Since Dorchester was a maximum security pen and it was in New Brunswick, Junior's family was unable to go visit him as much compared to the county jail being much, much closer. Um, his frequent visits turned into two hour visits once or twice a year around the holidays. Besides those visits with his family, the pretty much second best thing in his life was being safe in his cell locked up because at least when he was in his cell with the door closed, he knew he was safe. Dorchester is, um, like I said, a maximum security prison, and it is a very, very old prison as well. It has a lot of history, and there have been prison riots that have gone on there, 
And I also wanted to make a side note that if you guys are interested in me doing a video on some of the infamous prison riots that have gone on here in Canada, um, let me know down in the comments. I really want to cover those topics one day. So while doing his time in Dorchester, Junior seen things no human should ever see or experience. Things you couldn't even imagine if you haven't been to prison before. People being beaten, stabbed, killed, raped, everything you can possibly think of. And that goes for inmates and guards. No one is safe there. During Junior's time at Dorchester, his family was still backing him up 100% and was still doing all they could to fight for him. Junior's father went downtown every single day looking for the people Junior had described the night of the incident. He wanted to prove so badly that his son was telling the truth and he had been wrongfully convicted. And every Sunday at church, while Detective John McIntyre walked around doing collections and presenting himself as an outstanding citizen, Junior's father, Donald Marsh Sr., said no one could ever know the kind of feelings that went through him every Sunday. Junior's mother also fought for him tooth and nail and was very outspoken on the whole matter. She met with every single lawyer she possibly could and told them how Junior's been wrongfully convicted, um, but no lawyer would go near the case. They would tell her that there's nothing they can do since the marshals didn't have any money. Junior later stated that just because I have no money doesn't mean I'm guilty, which I think is a very powerful and true statement. After three years of being at Dorchester and having every appeal denied, he couldn't take it anymore. And he decided the best action for him to do next was to confess to stabbing Sandy Seal. But not because he had done it, but because he would never get a chance at parole if he didn't. You thought you thought I was gonna change it there, didn't ya? The weird thing about being in prison is that you'll most likely have an easier time um, applying for parole, getting an early release, kind of anything along those lines if you're able to, if you show remorse and show that you have accepted what you have, you've done. Um, but that doesn't work out well for someone who is wrongfully convicted. After Junior had confessed, he was moved to Spring Hill, which was a medium security facility, just like he wanted. His confession worked. And so once he got to Spring Hill, he recanted his confession, telling his classification officer that he confessed so he could get to Spring Hill and away from Dorchester. Now, a little more ways down the road, he did apply for parole a few more times, but he was denied on the grounds that now his story has changed multiple times. And now how could they believe anything that he says? As if they were even believing him before. In 1978, Junior and some other inmates were taken out for a camping trip that was overseen by a few guards. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. While out on that camping trip, it sparked an idea in Junior's mind. The next year in 1979, there was a week long canoeing trip with the Brotherhood Canoeing Expedition that inmates could apply to be a part of. And so Junior applied and was accepted. During the canoeing trip, Junior managed to escape from the group and the police tried to track him down with the police, but Junior was able to hide in the swamps undetected. We got a prison break kind of on our hands, folks. The news broke that a murderer was escaped and running loose from authorities and all hell broke loose. And of course, citizens just went nuts. Junior actually managed to make it all the way back to his girlfriend's house named Shelly Sarson, um, and he actually went into hiding there. Unfortunately, it didn't take long for the police to find out where Junior was. And so once they found out that Junior was at Shelly's house, they surrounded the house and they ended up sending one of Junior's friends in to try to convince him to come out and surrender to the police. And Junior was like, no way in hell, bro. And so a few minutes later, when after his friend left the police rushed in with guns being extremely violent like they do and when junior seen how the police had rushed in so violently he instantly decided to go peacefully with them not for any other reason but for the fact that he says that there was actually a small child in the room that the police had rushed into and he didn't want 
that little girl to see anything violent whatsoever. At this point, of course, Junior knew that his chances of getting free now were pretty much next to impossible. So yeah, um, October 31st, 1980, Junior was transferred back to Dorchester Maximum Security Penitentiary now that he was a known flight risk. Over the years Junior spent locked up in those prisons, Roy was creating his own sort of prison in hell. After the death of Sandy, Roy withdrew from everyone and his behavior became increasingly alarming. His family lived in fear of him, always fearing his violent drunken outbursts would come any second. One day, Roy's wife took in a boarder, a man named Mitchell, and he was actually able to get on Roy's good side and befriend him. One day, while Roy and Mitchell were hanging out, Roy had actually told Mitchell about how he had been walking through Wentworth Park years ago and got held up by a black man and an Indian. And while defending himself, he killed the black man and stabbed the Indian. Uh, but Mitchell didn't really believe him since Roy was known for telling outrageous stories. And once again, those are the terms that they were using. Those aren't my terms. <laughs> I'm sorry. Now, two years after Mitchell lived with Roy, um, in 1981, Mitchell was speaking with his sister and she actually invited him to come with her to visit her boyfriend. And Mitchell had never met her boyfriend before, so he agreed and was all for it. So Mitchell and his sister got in their car and they started driving to meet um, his sister's boyfriend who actually was doing time at Dorchester Penitentiary. And when Mitchell and his sister arrived at Dorchester, Junior was waiting to greet them. Mitchell's sister was Shelly Sarson, Junior's longtime girlfriend. Mitchell and Junior chatted for a while before Mitchell asked Junior if he knew anyone named Roy Epsery, to which Junior replied, no, he didn't know that man. And Mitchell explained to Junior how he had lived at Roy's house and at one point, Roy had told him how he had stabbed the black guy in Sydney and an Indian guy was doing the time for it and the rest of what Roy had told him. Junior was just absolutely blown away. Junior finally had the name of Sandy's killer. Now, he just had to prove it. Junior hired a new lawyer who took the information to the Sydney police, but John McIntyre, who was the main detective on Junior's case way back, was now the chief of police. So the case and the new developments had to be turned over to the RCMP. Even though the RCMP seemed to take this breakthrough information seriously, and they did start a third investigation into his case, they also seemed pretty skeptical. They went to go take their formal statement from Junior, but when they got there, they told him straight away, you have to tell us something we are going to believe or we are going to walk out of here and you're never going to see us again. Junior knew about how Roy was saying him and Sandy tried to rob him. And so Junior told the police that him and Sandy rolled, which was the term being thrown around, rolled Roy and Jimmy. And that's how he got stabbed and Sandy killed. Even though that really wasn't the truth, it was closer than Junior had ever gotten to anyone even slightly believing him of the whole truth. And what was about to come to light was that the police actually had Roy's name years ago from when Jimmy had went to the police 10 days after Junior was convicted. Now at this point in time with all the new developments, um, Roy had actually been kicked out of his house due to his alcoholism and rage and he was now living in a rooming house um, miserably by himself. RCMP Staff Sergeant Harry Wheaton was now leading the new investigation and was determined to find out what the truth really was. On February 22nd, 1982, Roy, who is now an old man in his 70s, admitted over the phone to Harry Wheaton that he had stabbed Sandy, um, but in self-defense. The problem was that he refused to actually come into the station to make a formal confession. Therefore, the RCMP had to do a lot more investigative work and try to find some actual hard evidence. Luckily, Roy's family was extremely cooperative this time around during the investigation, and Roy's son, Greg Epsery, turned over 10 knives that Roy had kept in a wooden basket that was still at the house. And lo and behold, 
after lab analysis of the knives, one of those knives had fibers that were a complete match to the jackets that Sandy Seal and Donald Marshall Jr. were wearing that night of the incident. And just like that, they finally had their first real pieces of physical forensic evidence of the Sanford Steele murder from 1971. On top of all of that, Roy's daughter, the one that was 13 years old back at the time, also came forward to the police, the daughter that was never interviewed. Um, she came forward to the police and told them that she had witnessed her dad cleaning blood off of a knife that night. Now, of course, the RCMP also went back and interviewed the three eyewitnesses, um, Patricia, Maynard, and John, and they all recanted their testimonies, stating how each one of them were coerced by the Sydney police officers as they tried to pin the case on Donald Marshall Jr. In March of 1982, the case was finally reopened officially and after almost 11 years of being in prison for a crime he didn't commit, Donald Marshall Jr. was released on parole pending an appeal. His mother and father drove up to Dorchester to get him and they ended up actually being about four to five hours late. And Jr. actually mentioned how the wait felt like it was the longest wait he ever felt, but he also stated how it was just very difficult for him to even walk out of the prison doors. Um, he stated, it was kind of scary to walk out of a place you've lived your whole life. Because yeah, at 17 years old, going to prison for 11 years really would feel like your whole life. So finally, on May 10th of 1983, the Nova Scotia Court of Appeal had made their decision. They decided that Donald Marshall Jr. should be acquitted since there was no evidence against him. They were actually not asked, however, to examine the issue of who was actually responsible for the wrongful conviction of Donald Jr., but they took it upon themselves to make it known that they felt Jr. was the one responsible and that he was the author of his own misfortune for not being completely truthful to the police. Donald Marshall Jr. was now the first person in Canada to have a wrongful conviction overturned and he also went on to be the first person to fight for compensation for his wrongful conviction, as he should. But what the appeal court judges had said during their decision was actually very damaging to Junior's efforts. He actually ended up settling for an extremely unfair amount of money. While Junior was battling for his compensation, Roy Epsery stood trial for the death of Sandy Seal, but on the context that it was self-defense during a robbery. The defense tried to push the argument that Junior and Sandy were trying to rob him um, and Jimmy at that night. And he, they also tried to push the narrative that Junior was drunk, all of which was actually not true at all. In 1985, Roy Epsery was finally convicted of manslaughter and sentenced to three years. But unlike Junior, Roy was able to successfully appeal his conviction twice until the third appeal in 1986, where he was finally and officially convicted of manslaughter. However, because there's always a however, Nova Scotia Court of Appeals dropped his three year prison sentence to one year due to his poor health. Remember, he was in his seventies. After serving his little one year prison sentence, Roy Epsery died of natural causes in 1988. But this case doesn't end there. The public was outraged that Junior had spent almost 11 years in prison for a crime that he didn't commit and a public inquiry was demanded and eventually the Canadian government caved and agreed. The public inquiry lasted three years and examined everything that had happened and finally, John McIntyre was exposed for all of his corruption and he finally had to face the public for what he had done. This public inquiry resulted in an over 16,000 page Royal Commission report and along with it had 82 recommendations that actually fundamentally changed the criminal justice system in Nova Scotia 19 years after Junior was wrongfully convicted. 
Better late than never, though. During this public inquiry, it was revealed that there never was a robbery. Junior never lied to the police. He never stabbed Sandy Seal. All of the manipulation and the corrupt police work was also brought to light and how Junior had been failed by the Canadian justice system at every single turn. The Nova Scotia Court of Appeal judges and their conduct was actually also looked into, thankfully. And on January 26, 1990, Junior was finally completely exonerated of all wrongdoing and he was not responsible for his own wrongdoing like the Nova Scotia Court of Appeals had stated earlier. And also, thankfully, the public uh, inquiry looked into the compensation that Junior was given, but it was actually only changed to a lump sum of around $300,000. And then he was given a monthly allowance for a certain amount of time. And then after that, the amount of time was expanded to the age of 93. I know that's a little confusing, um, and I apologize. Now, if he was to pass away before the age of 93, the money would not continue to be paid out to his family or anything like that. Which, um, knowing all of that information and comparing it to the millions of dollars that are handed out in today's wrongful conviction cases, it should be extremely embarrassing for the Canadian government um, for having this first wrongful conviction person who just happened to be an Indigenous person put on a monthly payment plan with an expiration date. Just a few years after Junior was exonerated in 1993, Junior was fighting with the Canadian justice system again after being arrested and charged for fishing commercially without a license. Well, you know, they should have learned the first time not to mess with Donald Marshall Jr. because Jr. took his small amount of compensation money that he had received and he went on to fight the courts with his ancestral rights and, tr and the treaties that were signed back when the white foreigners first arrived long ago. Jr. took his case all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada and won. This resulted in the Marshall decision and opened up economic opportunities for the First Nations people that had been stricken away over the years. It was also revealed later on in time that he was actually supposed to be compensated around, I think it was $2 million for his fight in all of this, but he actually made out with like 125 k Now, I actually have nowhere to fit this in properly, so I'm just going to throw it in here since we just talked about the fishing stuff, but the First Nations people in Nova Scotia's fishing rights are still being threatened to this day. And I think more people need to know about it. Non-Indigenous people have been cutting the lobster traps. They've been vandalizing the fishing equipment. They've been stealing. And they've actually gone as far as to torch and sink the Indigenous fishing boats um, along with some vehicles. And... It's just really outrageous. It is going on now in 2021, 2022. And so if you'd like to know more about that, I will have some links down below for that. But anyways, back to the topic at hand. In 2003, Junior had a double lung transplant um, due to the damage to his lungs um, that possibly came during exposure to harsh chemicals while being trained as an industrial plumber while in prison. Since he had double lung transplant and was on all sorts of anti-rejection drugs, he was told that he would not be able to have kids and that he probably only had about three years to live. But once again, Junior defeated the odds and his wife, Colleen, who he married in 2006, became pregnant and Junior had a son. And since the government's measly little monthly checks just weren't enough, Junior actually had to go back to work to support his family and make sure that they would be well off. Since he knew he was pushing the clock with given three years to live and what being already past five years. Another thing Junior had done with his compensation money, besides fighting the Canadian camp government even more, he used his money to run indigenous camps for at-risk youth. Junior talked of how he felt he accomplished things in his life, but he was still tormented by the fact that so many people walked free from the whole ordeal. 
hidden evidence, lying in court, etc., all of that stuff. A lot of people got away without even a scratch. Donald Marshall Jr. died Thursday, October 6th in 2009 in Sydney, Nova Scotia due to kidney failure caused by the anti-rejection drugs he was taking for his double lung transplant. The wrongful conviction uh, of Donald Marshall Jr. and the death of Sandy Seal are still having impacts on the Canadian justice system to this very day. Just a few years ago, back in February 2019, um, a new Nova Scotia policy was put in place um, to better ensure the fair treatment of Indigenous people in the criminal prosecution system. Its aim is to guide Crown attorneys on how to conduct criminal prosecutions of Indigenous peoples and to take into account their unique history and culture. It also takes into account the history and discrimination and problems faced by the Indigenous communities. They hope that this new policy addresses the fact that Indigenous peoples are disproportionately involved in the justice system. And I'm done. That's the end of today's video. And now I want to know what you guys think about all of this. Personally, my thoughts are just, I feel really bad for Sandy Seal and his family because um, through all of this, I feel as though his name was almost lost. And in the end, his true killer only spent one year in jail. As if Sandy's life equaled one year in jail. Like, that's, it's just really appalling. Um, but holy crap, if you guys are still here, thank you so much. This is guaranteed to be my longest video ever. Obviously, I don't know because I still have to edit. But wow, my stuff is almost going to die. So I'm going to turn this off now. Thank you so much for watching. I want to let you guys know that my goal for 2022 is to start getting way more consistent with these videos. And so I'm putting it out there that I'm putting it out there to all of you guys that um, I really want to start posting a lot more. And so I'm putting it out there. So I actually hope that it makes me do it. Thank you so much again and stay safe out there and maybe avoid public parks at night. Have a good one, guys.